Dave Nelson is a certified information systems security professional with 20 years of experience and a fellow with the Information System Security Association. He has led technology organization in both the public and the private sector. Prior to founding Integrity, he most recently was the Chief Information Security Officer for a leading health informat informatics company. He has also managed an information security group for a top five US banking organizations, was a CIO for a higher education institutions, and served as an information security office officer for one of the largest mun municipal governments on the East Coast. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dave Nelson here. Please welcome Dave Nelson. All right, everybody, thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Dave, and I usually start this out by telling you that my wife and I have four children. Uh, the oldest is now a teenager. So what that means for you is that there's absolutely nothing you can do that's going to throw me off my game. You can sit there, you can roll your eyes at me, you can shake your head, you can nod off, you can jump up and down in your seat. It's not going to throw me off my game. So. Uh, if you have any questions while we go, feel free to ask. You're not going to you know, throw my timing off or anything like that. I'd rather uh, have you talk uh, uh, as we go. The only thing I will ask is this is a large room. I'm slightly hard of hearing. Uh, and so you're going to have to basically shout the question at me. So just jump up and down, shake your hand, and then shout the question at me, and I'll answer it as we go. So uh, we're going to talk about social engineering today. Uh, the, you'll kind of get an idea of why as we go through here. Um, but we're going to start out with really what is social engineering uh, at its core. Then we're going to move into some real world attacks. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is show you if somebody wants to hack your organization without actually hacking the technology, how is that going to look? And I'm going to kind of walk you through what I would do if I were going to really do a full scale social engineering attack against your organization. Uh, some of you may look at this and say, well, Dave, you're a little bit crazy. There's no way anybody would do all of this. I can tell you you're 100% absolutely wrong. Uh, there is a lot of social engineering happening today, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, after we get through all of that, we're going to spend just a few minutes on some of the defenses uh, that you can use to protect your organization against social engineering. So without further ado, let's talk about specifically what social engineering is. Uh, I'm a little bit at a loss here because I'm usually a mover and shaker and like to run around. I don't like being stuck at this podium, so if I look like I'm a little antsy, I probably am. Uh, but we'll, we'll work through that. So. When, when you look at social engineering at its core, um, what we're saying is we want to try and find a way to elicit a certain user behavior or a human behavior. Okay? And, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, I know how a user or how an individual is going to react, and so therefore, I'm going to get them to do something for me. Okay? And the thing that I'm going to get you to do for me is usually not in your best interest. It's usually in my best interest. Anybody have? A two-year-old at home or have had a two-year-old at home or been a two-year-old? OK, great. So you all know what the term manipulation means, right? Good. Okay, That's exactly what we're talking about here. How do we manipulate people into doing what we want them to do for us? Okay? As adults, we think that people who manipulate others are kind of mean and nasty. All right, And that you're absolutely right. But what we're going to find is that this is exactly what's happening. We're manipulating people to get what we want. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we do is we look at the idea of sociology and psychology. You say, Dave, um, this isn't a college class. We're talking about technology here. No, we're talking about humans here. Okay? We're talking about the human element of technology. And so what we're looking at is how do we, deter or how do we study and determine what are some societal norms? Right? How do humans interact with each other? How do they communicate with each other? What's acceptable? What's not acceptable? Okay? So we try and really study that, that sociology and psychology part of human interaction so that we can understand how are humans going to relate to each other. Okay? The next thing we do is we look at that and say, well, if I really study through generations and generations and centuries and centuries uh, of, of human history, I can begin 
to predict how an individual is going to react in a specific situation pretty accurately, right? We know if you whip up a media frenzy about a hurricane that's going to land, people are going to freak out, right? I grew up in Florida and Virginia, so I know all about freaking out with hurricanes and how the media makes it out to be a lot worse than it typically is. Now, in this case, a Category 4 storm, that's a pretty nasty storm, and people need to be freaking out, okay? But we also know that we can predict how people are going to react to just simply seeing something on TV or in passing. Uh, I have a younger brother. He's two years younger than I am. I realized, uh, I think I was about 12 or 13, that he was going to be a lot bigger than I was. Uh, and so I would just, in passing, say things that I knew would get him mad, and he'd whack me, and my mom and dad would see that, and they'd get all on his case because uh, they saw him act out, and they didn't see me and my little silver tongue, you know, kind of doing the thing. And then my mom finally said, yeah, I know what you said. I know what you did, and that caused him to react. So now you're the one that's getting it, and he's got free. Uh, okay, I need to change my tactics then, right? So the next thing we can say is if we can predict those actions, I can also influence those actions, right? Because if I know by putting you in a certain situation or saying a specific thing to you or withholding something from you that you're going to react in a certain way, I can influence you by doing that. I knew that my brother couldn't stop and listen to me calling him an idiot or whatever it happened to be and would whack me. And so if I wanted to get him in trouble, all I had to do was say, hey, stupid, and boom. And then I just had to make sure that I was in front of mom and dad when it happened, and it was all golden, right? So these are the things that social engineering attackers are deciding, okay? They're looking at it and saying, I know how humans interact. I know what's being taught in the workplace. I know what we're supposed to be seeing, what we're not supposed to be seeing. And I can craft a scenario that's going to put you in a situation to get you to do exactly what I want you to do based on this information that I have. Okay? So what we're really looking at here are focusing in on two types of behavior. Okay? If you know anything about psychology and sociology, we have two types of behavior. Okay. Go back to that two-year-old uh, uh, scenario. Okay. You do not have to teach a two-year-old how to throw a temper tantrum. Right? I didn't have to teach mine. Uh, you don't have to teach a, a, a two-year-old to be greedy. Mine, mine, mine. That's nature. That's human nature. Okay? That's our natural behavior. We know this about people. Okay? However, as we get older, hopefully, we've all learned, if you don't get your way, you don't storm out of a room and yell and scream and throw stuff. I know occasionally it still does happen, but typically that's not acceptable behavior. That's our learned behavior, okay? The problem is, is that many of us, when we are put in a stressful situation, when we are put in a situation that makes us uncomfortable, uh, we're going to back away and go back into our natural, learned, or our natural behavior versus our learned behavior, okay? Anybody here, uh, military, first responder, anybody like that, okay? Training, right? What we're trying to do is make our learned behavior our natural behavior. We're trying to train individuals that when you encounter something like a burning building, you don't run from it, you run into it. Okay? That is not natural behavior, but we're trying to make it so ingrained that our learned behavior becomes our natural behavior so that even when we are stressed, even when we're put in a situation that isn't normal, we're not gonna default back to this natural behavior, okay? So keep that in mind because when we get to the defense, that's gonna be a key part of it, training our users, making sure that their learned behavior becomes more of their natural behavior, okay? So Let's talk then about some of the real world experiences or real world types of things. Uh, Integrity does a bunch of social engineering testing for our clients. So the things that I'm going to tell you are things that we have either seen or done or experienced in the field. Okay? These are not made up. These are things that, uh, that we've either done ourselves uh, or as a part of, of breach, re uh, breach response, incident response, uh, digital forensics, uh, digital uh, investigations, we've seen components of these things as a part of, uh, of that response. So these are real world, real world examples. Okay? So why do we talk about social engineering? Well, if you read the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, what you will find is that as of this year, about one in three successful data breaches have a social engineering component to them. So 30%, 33%, somewhere in that neighborhood. That means 
that they have something to do with human attacks, okay? This is important because it's drastically on the rise. In just the last five years, that's gone from very, very minimal, one in, I can't remember what the statistic was, like one in 20 to one in three in just the last like five years. That's, that's a pretty big rise. It's actually number three right now as far as attack vectors. True full-on hacking, malware is number two, and then social engineering is number three. So this is really, really important stuff. That's why we're talking about it. So what are the five common, most common types of, of social engineering attacks that you'll see? Uh, dumpster diving is one. Pretexting, which is kind of a fake phone call. We're gonna talk about these in detail. Phishing emails, physical entry, and then enticement. So starting with dumpster diving, okay? It's really not as nasty as it sounds. Because think about it. How many of you have recycle bins? Where's all your paper go? In either the recycle bin or the shred bin, right? And then maybe some of it ends up in the nasty food trash, right? But most of it's sitting at your desk. Most of the things that you print out or that you write hand notes on that you don't deem worthy of being shredded go directly in the recycle bin. So as a social engineer, all I have to do is hang around out back your building and wait for all the trash to come out at night, and it's already separated for me. I don't even have to get nasty and dirty. I just pick out a bunch of clear plastic trash bags that are 99.95% .95 paper. And it's a treasure trove of information. You can see the list of things that we find in there. We find source code snippets. We find network diagrams with IP addresses and all sorts of stuff, data flow diagrams. We find uh, negotiation documents, we find pricing documents, I mean, all sorts of stuff that most companies, if, was, if it was used by somebody nefariously, they would try and go after that in a court of law and consider that trade secrets. Hey, our customer list. If you left your company and took your customer list with you and started calling on all of those customers of your former company, you would find yourself behind a big lawsuit saying that you stole trade secrets but yet we're willing to throw it out in the trash all day, every day, okay? How many people still use a paper planner? Anybody? All right, good. We got at least one. I never had a room uh, where I've not gotten at least one, okay? Uh, when I talk to business people and not technology people, that grows to about 50%. 50% or so of your business leaders, especially your executives in your C-suite, still are using paper. It's a generational thing. Okay. All of these things are sitting there, and they've got these handwritten notes on there. They've got contacts. They've got uh, all of the different places that they're going to go. Uh, my uh, assistant um, does not print out my paper calendar and send it with me anywhere I go, but I know other executives that do. Okay. So on that piece of paper, they've got, hey, what meeting am I going to be at? Uh, what's the dial-in number? What's the passcode? If I'm leading the meeting, it's got my moderator code on there, right? It's all on a piece of paper. Guess what? Half the time, that finds its way in a trash can somewhere, not in a shred bin. You may say, Dave, why does that matter? Who cares if you have a conference line? Well, think about this. Anybody ever been on a conference call and you hear the bloop bloop? You say, hey, this is Dave. Who joined? Hello? Hello, anybody there? Okay, I guess not. Well, yeah, I was there, I just didn't answer, okay? So now I've just hacked into your system by hacking into this conference call that I'm not supposed to be on, okay? When we're talking about social engineering, here's the big key thing to remember, trust. The thing that I am trying to build is trust. If I can get you to trust me, I'm golden, okay? If I can get you to believe that I'm an insider, I've, I've won the battle. The easiest way to get you to believe that I'm an insider, that I belong, is to have information that only an insider would have. So when you look at all of these pieces of information here, you say, aha, now I get it. There's some, maybe some information there that's, that's not classified or, or it's not a trade secret, but if I'm beginning to try and build trust within an organization, there's a lot of things in there that only internal people would know. 
And if I have that information, I must be internal because only internal people would know that, okay? A big thing to remember is trust. As you're thinking about social engineering, think about how a, a social engineer is building trust or attempting to build trust, okay? The thing that I'm gonna do then is once I've gotten some of this information out of the trash, once I've either joined a, a conference call or I think I've got enough information where I can make some phone calls, I'm gonna call in and I'm gonna try and fake my way into the organization, okay? How many people have call centers where they work? Anybody? Call center, customer service, sales, anything, right? Okay, most of you. The rest of you are just floating along. Your business doesn't deal with any customers. <laughs> okay, that's a great business model. I'd like to learn that one. Um, the, the idea here is that most of us have gone through a pretty robust training program for our customer service representatives, for our call centers. You never, ever, ever give out social security number or uh, driver's license number, or credit card information, or bank information, or whatever it happens to be. Don't ever give it out. Well, guess what? If I'm really good at social engineering, the very last thing I'm gonna do is call your contact center and ask for my account number. Not gonna happen. That's not how I'm gonna do it, okay? Because your little radar is gonna go off and be like ding, 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 a little red bell or red lights flashing and bells going off saying, wait, 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 this is exactly what I was told. Somebody's gonna call in and ask for this information and I never ever get it unless I have 18 different pieces of verification code. Okay, fine, you get all of that, then you can give me the information. But I'm never gonna ask for that, okay? I'm gonna do something better. I'm gonna offer to help you. How many people are gonna turn down help? Not too many, okay? How many people, especially sitting in a call center, are gonna turn down more access to the internet for their computer? Well, I heard you guys were having some internet issues and, and it was really locked down. It's not supposed to be locked down. You're supposed to be able to get to Facebook. If you just give me access to your computer real quick, I can work that magic and get you back access to Facebook. Yeah, uh-huh, now you begin to see I'm playing on those emotions. People are already frustrated because they don't have Facebook and they're sitting there and you know they've got five minutes between calls or whatever it happens to be, or they're on their 15 minute break but they can't leave, they gotta kinda sit there. Uh, and so they wanna be able to surf and, and uh, you know, do that or they wanna be able to go shop Amazon or whatever it happens to be. Okay? Or I'm gonna call into an engineering department. Say, hey, I heard you guys were having some problems with SolidWorks. If you uh, can give me remote access, I would be able to help you with that. I haven't asked for any information yet. I'm just asking to help you. I don't need your username and password. Don't worry, I'm not asking for a username and password. I just need you to click this. It'll provide me remote access and I'll be able to solve it for you and I don't need your username and password. Well, you're right. I don't need your username and password because I'll be logged in as you. I'll have a remote desktop session, so I don't need it. Okay? The thing is, is our end users aren't trained to deal with this. Our end users are trained to deal with somebody asking for their username and password. They're not trained to deal with somebody offering to help and not doing any sort of validation of who are you with? Are you with our company help desk? How do I know that? Do you have a code that you can give me? Is there a trouble ticket? You know, how do we identify or, or, or make sure that we're testing those individuals who are calling in and, and saying that they're gonna help us, okay? Here's another example. Uh, I'm gonna call in and I'm going to ask for somebody in accounting. I need to know accounts payable information so that I can pay you money, or, or receivable information so I can pay you money. We owe you money. If you can give me your bank account, I can deposit the, the money in, okay? Happens all the time. Okay? And we're gonna go through a pretty specific phishing example to kind of show you this, okay? Another great one is, hey, this is Dave from IT. I, uh, have a new computer for you. We're gonna be coming uh, around on Wednesday and uh, we'll get that replaced for you. Oh, you have a meeting on Wednesday. I already know you have a meeting on Wednesday because I had your day, your day planner or I had somebody else's day planner and I could see the, who all was in that meeting. Hey, that's not a problem at all. Just leave your computer logged in uh, and I will come in and get it. Or better yet, if you just give me your username and password, I can set this one up and it'll be all ready when you get back from your meeting. Just tell your coworkers that I'm coming so they don't freak out when they see a guy coming around, you know, pulling the computer out. Perfect, great, yeah, Wednesday at nine o'clock, that'd be awesome. Hey, by the way, I'm gonna send you a quick email uh, just to validate that I am coming so we can get this in our system. 
Uh, and then also it's got kind of just a, a quick customer service uh, um, uh, uh, survey on there. We're trying to improve our customer service score. So if you put in your user ID for me uh, and your computer number uh, and uh, like your cube number and stuff like that, that would be great so I know exactly where I'm coming and we can get some, uh, some scores uh, from you. That's great, perfect, thank you very much. Oh, and by the way, um, because we're trying to do this independently, uh, the survey is actually gonna be coming from SurveyMonkey, not from an internal address. So when you see a SurveyMonkey email, uh, go ahead and, and click on it, it's fine, it's not a problem. Bingo, okay. So now I've gotten some information from the dumpster, right? I use that with a pretexting phone call and I've now just set you up for a phishing email, okay? A spear phishing attack. And so, I mean, we all know what spear phishing is, right? You're, 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 you're phishing one particular individual or one very small group of individuals, okay? It's not like your mass phishing campaigns. So the idea here is, again, I'm not trying to elicit any information from you. I'm trying to help you, and this is just a part of that helping. I've not asked for your username and password. Maybe I'll ask for it in this phishing email, and quite frankly, probably about 50% of the time, we're gonna get it, right? Uh, we just did one where an organization uh, had just completed all of their security awareness training, included some social engineering, uh, and about 70% of the people gave us their username and password their network Active Directory username and password. Guess what? We own that company. There is nothing that anything can happen, or nothing that that company can do that's gonna stop any of the attacks that we can throw at them after that. It's just, it's, it's just gonna be impossible. We will find somebody that has high enough level access through a VPN, through a web portal, wherever, okay? And then once I'm actually gonna, or what I'm actually gonna do is once I get all of this information, uh, I'm gonna continue to fish you or I'm gonna fish other people in the organization, okay? Uh, we all know the you know, sweet deals and you know, the help me help you, you gotta see this. Th these are the emails, the phishing emails that are really easy to spot. Let me give you a phishing example that's not easy to spot. This is a pretty much a, a verbatim text of a particular email that came to one of our clients and it follows very, very closely to uh, some other things that the FBI has been working on recently. Okay, uh, this was a kind of a real world example. Uh, names have been changed, obviously. So Sandy is the, uh, the CEO of this organization. Mary is the CFO and Mike works in accounting, okay? Uh, this particular email says, hey, Mike, you may or may not know, but Mary, your boss and I, uh, we're in Atlanta. We're working to close this big deal. Uh, we've got two partners we're working with, ABC and XYZ, and we're trying to put together this nice package deal so we can sell this thing to um, our big payday Inc. Okay? So what I need is I need for you to wire a very specific amount of money to XYZ and this very specific amount to ABC. Oh, by the way, Mary says this should come from our bank name okay, and the account number right there. And you need to route it to the routing number for XYZ's bank is this and their account number is that. For ABC, their bank routing number is this and their account number is that. That's pretty specific information, isn't it? How many people believe routing numbers are private information? Anybody? Okay. How many people believe bank account numbers are private information? How many people think I'm asking you a trick question because there's no possible way I could be standing up here and not? Good, it is a trick question. Both of those pieces of information are public. FDIC publishes a list of every bank, every credit union, and their routing number. Uh, the uh, banks themselves publish it. You probably publish it on your accounts payable and receivable page so people know how to send you money or request money, okay? Uh, your bank information, anybody here still use a paper checkbook? Anybody here receive a check from anybody, okay? Guess what's on the bottom of every single paper check that's ever written? Your bank routing number and your bank account number, okay? So to an untrained eye, and even a lot of accounting professionals, okay, that aren't auditors, that aren't CPAs, okay, that aren't in the banking uh, uh, arena, that information appears to be private. Nobody would know that, or nobody, they think that nobody should know that information except for an insider, so that appears pretty legit. And oh, by the way, this scenario was actually happening. This company's CEO and CFO were actually in this other city working with a couple of partners trying to close a big, huge deal. Again, trust, information that probably only somebody inside the organization would know. 
Now, just to kind of dial it up a notch, play on those fears and really turn this into a deep social engineering experiment, Sandy down here says, hey, by the way, Mike, our big payday, Inc., they're a publicly traded company, and if news of this big deal gets out before their SEC filing deadline, you and I are both going to prison. I don't know about you, but I don't look good in orange, so keep your big mouth shut. If you need anything, shoot me your phone number and I'll give you a call. Sound like something a CEO would say? You better believe it, okay? Now, if you don't know anything about insider trading, uh, what you should know is that you have to actually, A, have intent to profit from the information that you're sharing or that somebody that you're giving it to has the intent to profit and that they actually do, okay? Uh, there's a bunch of, uh, I'm not an attorney, I'm not giving you legal advice here, but what you need to understand is that it's very, very hard, one, to prove insider trading, okay? And two, to actually be convicted of it is even harder, Okay, so it's really, really difficult for that scenario to actually play out. And oh, by the way, just talking about something inside, even if you posted it on the internet, but didn't have the intent that somebody would be able to profit off of it, trying to prove that you were colluding with somebody to, to create an insider trading environment uh, would be very, very difficult. So that probably isn't even going to happen. So this is a great example. This, this particular email was actually caught um, by, the, um, by one of the accounting people in one of the departments or in the department of one of our clients. Uh, they grabbed it at the last minute and said, hey, we probably want to validate this before we do anything else. So it's a good thing for them because they would have lost a lot of money. Uh, FBI was working a case over in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, where a company got an email like this and they transferred $17 million dollars to overseas accounts, and then they didn't call them for 10 days. If you have something like this happen and you fall for it, call the FBI and the Secret Service immediately. Within 24 to 48 hours, money can be returned, okay? We've got enough leeway in the banking system that we can get that money back, okay, in most cases. If it goes out of the US, about 24 hours, depends on where it goes, um, if it's going to certain countries that we don't have agreements with, it's just gone. But if it goes to other countries, we might have 24 uh, hours, possibly up to 48 hours. So there is a big reason to call the FBI in a case like this. Okay? So I already sent you that email that says, hey, I'm going to come replace your computer at 9 o'clock on Wednesday. Now I'm actually going to show up. Guess what? I'm going to get in. How many of you work in what you would consider a secure facility with Badges, turnstiles, um, guards, visitor desk, visitor sign in. Only like two of you? Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I asked if, it, if I said, are you supposed to be in a secure facility? Yes. <laughs> so uh, the reality is, is we will get in. Okay. And it's not going to be what you think. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite ways to do this, uh, one of our team's favorite ways to do this, is to walk up with a laptop bag over one shoulder, like a, a, a badge on this hip right here, and two bags of Panera bagels on like a Tuesday morning. Okay? And we walk up and we kind of do one of these. You want some bagels, don't you? That's exactly how it happens. Okay? My badge is going to beep all day long. It ain't going to work, but it's going to beep. Do you know the difference between a successful beep and a unsuccessful beep on your badge system? Probably not. It might not even be different. <laughs> so all I got to do is have a little inkjet printer that I can fake my way into building a, you know, uh, uh, printing a little badge off that looks like you're slapping it on top of my RFID tag, and away we go. And you're going to let me in. Uh, we walk straight in, greet the, the uh, receptionist, turn around, and hop an elevator, and go right up to the executive suite, and walk right into an executive suite. And nobody's questioned us. We took over a conference room in the executive suite, switched it to in use, and nobody said anything. Somebody walked in. We've got two people in there hacking the daylights out of this organization from the inside. And they apologized for interrupting us. 
okay? It happens. I, I, I happen to be doing it one time, and director of risk management, I, three hours walking around an organization, you get kind of bored, okay? So I happen to go up to this other executive suite, this other building, and I'm thirsty, I want something to drink, so I go into the kitchenette, and I'm standing there, I'm drinking some water, and the director of risk management walks in, who had known who I was, and he's like, what are you doing here? Do we have a meeting? How did you get in here? I said, well, I'm doing exactly what you told us to do like three months ago. Oh, how long have you been here? I don't know, two, three hours? <laughs> Shakes his head, walks away, doesn't say anything else. That's how easy it is, okay? I can also get really devious, okay? I could walk up and I could be in blue cargo pants, okay? And a blue t-shirt that says fire across the front. And I can put a radio on my hip with a mic over my shoulder and a silver clipboard. And I can say, hey, I'm Dave. I'm um, just here to take a quick look at your fire extinguishers, your fire escapes, and your fire alarm system. Uh, can you show me where those are? How many people think I've done something illegal? Another trick question. No, I have not done anything illegal. I did not tell you I was from the fire department. I was not wearing a logo for a specific fire department. I was not doing anything that could be construed as telling you that I was from the fire department. As long as I'm very careful with what I say, I haven't done anything illegal. Just because you assume that based on the way I'm dressed, okay, again, sociology, psychology, if I look like a fireman, I must be a fireman, right? Absolutely. So I'm gonna get in and I'm gonna be like, after the third one and be like, you know, I can probably just find them. If you want to go back to your desk, it's not a problem. Oh, okay, that's great. I'll come find you when I'm done. Oh, okay, that's great. I know I have free reign of the building, whatever I want. And because I haven't done anything illegal, I don't care about the police. You can call the police, go ahead. That's fine. The worst thing it's gonna do is the officer is gonna say, um, sir, you need to leave. Okay, they invited me in. They don't like me anymore, I'll leave. I'll take my toys and go home, okay? If I'm really stupid, I'm gonna argue with the officer and he's gonna be like, okay, fine. Uh, I'm gonna charge you with trespassing and we're gonna take you downtown. Okay, fine. And I'm gonna go downtown and I'm gonna get booked for misdemeanor trespassing uh, and then I'll bond out for $25, which is 10% of my $250 fine and I'll be out in 20 minutes. Not a big deal. Now, um, yeah, it's an inconvenience, but at the end of the day, it wasn't a big deal, okay? Now, I'm not gonna be stupid enough to do that, I'm just gonna walk out, or as soon as I think they're calling somebody, I'm gonna hightail it out a side door, okay? The idea is, again, I believed I was supposed to be there, so therefore you believed I was supposed to be there. When I walked in with my bagels, I'm not gonna shy away, I'm gonna introduce myself as Dave, I'm the new guy. Hey, can you tell me where this individual is? Let's see, 9C, yeah, I need cubicle 9C. Steve said I could come replace his computer today, so I need to go replace his computer. Where am I gonna get a computer? That empty cube right there looks like it's got a good computer in it. I'm gonna take that one and go. I'm gonna show up at Steve's desk with a new computer, or what looks like it's a new computer to him. Nobody's gonna say boo to me, okay? If you don't believe this happens, it happens all the time. We went to a, a fairly large bank, multiple data center bank. So we went to their secondary data center first, got right in. Nobody's watching us, nobody does anything. So we take equipment out of the data center. It wasn't plugged in, don't worry. It's not like I was gonna take stuff that's plugged in the rack, right? But there's stuff there that's been decommissioned, it says decommissioned right on it. Okay, fine, we'll take it. I'm sure it's got something on it, okay? We called their VP of, of IT and said, hey, by the way, we have this stuff. Um, what do you want us to do with it? And she says, huh, wouldn't it be funny if you just brought it over to our other uh, data center and could put it back in there. Uh, wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> okay, if you want us to. So guess what we did? We drove over there and there were four police cars sitting in the driveway that weren't for us, thankfully. Uh, there was a big accident there that we took a little bit to figure that out. Uh, but then we walked right in and we got into their primary data center just as easy and we put the data, the stuff back in the primary data center and we called her and said, hey, by the way, all that stuff is back in your data center, the primary, um, you can go down and get whenever you want. She basically just hung up on us because she was so mad, not at us, but at, at her people. 
So this stuff happens, okay? And this is a larger bank. That's, this is not like, hey, some small organization. These are people that should know better, okay? So physical entry works, okay? The last thing I'm gonna do is when I'm there, I'm going to plug in some USB drives. I'm gonna drop some USB drives. I'm gonna try and entice you to put this USB drive into a computer. The way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna stick it in a folder that says year-end bonuses. <laughs> Who doesn't wanna know what kind of bonus your boss is getting? Or the CEO, right? I mean, curiosity kills the cat like how many times? Okay? But the idea is, you may say, oh Dave, I would never do that. I'm an upstanding citizen. I'm, I'm not gonna sneak around and figure out what bonuses are happening. Okay, that's fine. There's probably a lot of people in your organization that's just gonna turn that in. Flip it around. What if it says 2017 merger and layoffs? <laughs> Ooh, there's a whole different story. Now you got people saying, wait, 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 am I on the layoff list? I, I, I got a family to worry about. I'm worried about the layoffs. Now, maybe they aren't gutsy enough to plug this into their computer at work. Okay, that's fine. I'd love it if you did. Okay? Maybe you're not gutsy enough. You plug it into your computer at home. <laughs> That's just like Christmas in July for Dave. Okay? Because now I own your home computer. Because it probably has way fewer controls than the one at work does. Oh, but by the way, you remember that phishing email where I got your Active Directory username and password? Yeah. How many people have remote access? How many people have webmail access? How many people have access to some sort of web application that you're supposed to be doing stuff? And oh, it integrates with Active Directory authentication for single sign-on, right? So I'm in. I don't care if you do it at home. I don't care if you do it at work. I'm going to get in, okay? This is exactly how easy this is. From start to finish, I start with just picking up a simple piece of paper that has information that you believe to be non-critical. And I turn that into a full-scale social engineering attack where I have completely infiltrated your entire organization and have not had to technically hack any system. I've evaded every single IDS IPS system. I've evaded every single firewall. I've evaded every single fraud routine, everything, because I am an authorized user that is trusted. That's the difference. Okay. So when you put all of this together, you can look at this and say, well, that's a pretty targeted attack. You're absolutely right. Guess what? This is the new reality. Most of us that are going to be victims of a data breach, it's going to be targeted. It's going to be crafted specifically for you. Now, how far are they going to go? Well, that's debatable. But most of the data breaches today are targeted attacks towards an organization. They're crafted specifically to get some specific data or financial motive or whatever happens to be against that organization. They're not drive-by attacks. Occasionally, they still are. There's no doubt about it, and those things still happen. But the big ones, the ones you need to be worrying about, the ones that are gonna cost you a billion dollars, in lost revenue, in lost customers, in lost value of your company, those are the ones that are going to be targeted attacks. And they are going to be long, and they are going to be complex. Okay? Um, one of the things that you need to think about is it's getting harder to do the technical hacks. Okay? It's getting much harder to do that. So social engineering is a way that we can gain new information, intel. Okay? If you think about a military mission, Intel makes or breaks that mission, okay? Same thing with a hacking mission. Good intel or bad intel will make or break that hacking attack, okay? So that's why this stuff is so important, okay? When you think about this, think about one thing, okay? This is all gonna be done in stealth mode. You're not gonna notice me walking up with my bagels and think, hey, that's a hacker. I don't look like a hacker. I'm not acting like a hacker. I'm in the real world, not the digital world. I'm, I can't be a hacker. Right? You're going to be seeing these things in bits and pieces, and you're not going to be able to put it all together until it's too late because you're not looking for it. You're not training your users to think about it. You've got to be able to give them something to think about, something to look at. Okay? Don't fall for the long con. Okay? Again, being able to detect these things. It's nothing more than a con job. We're, we're, we're talking about people being manipulated, okay? And it's not, as you can see from the example I just gave you, it's not just a quick hit. 
It's something where I'm spending maybe even a few weeks developing each phase of this and carrying it out. And I'm probably carrying it out against multiple people in multiple departments to increase my chance of success. Okay? So it's going to happen. It's going to be a very long process. So how do we defend against this? Okay? One of the best things I can tell you is a strong paper destruction process. I cannot stress this enough. We find so much stuff laying on a desk that's in a, or not laying on a desk, but maybe under a desk in just a recycle bin, okay? We find things in the recycle bin. One of the things we do is we walk around and as we go through, we just open the recycle bin. We grab a whole bunch of stuff out and jam it in our bag and we walk out. And there's just a gold mine of information in the recycle bin, okay? Start shredding all of your paper. If it's got anything that's printed on it or handwritten on it, shred it. The, the cost to do that is, is like this. The, the reduction in your risk is like this, okay? So shred your paper. Limit facility ingress and egress points, okay? Force people to come in and out a few entrances instead of every single door in the building can be in and out, okay? It increases the likelihood that I'm gonna be spotted by somebody who's watching, okay? That I'm gonna be caught on a camera or that I'm gonna be deterred because there is a camera and I don't want my face on the camera or to increase or decrease my chances of being caught, I'm gonna wear a ball cap and I'm the only one walking into a, uh, an office with a ball cap on and so I look a little suspicious, okay? That facility ingress and egress point gives you a chance to try and catch me. I'm not gonna say it's gonna drastically increase your chances, but it does increase your chance. It also decreases my desire to try and get in that way because I know if there's limited ingress, that usually means that they're monitored more closely. And so therefore, there's a higher chance that I'm gonna be caught as soon as I walk in the door. Okay. Uh, next one, challenge unknown people in secure areas. Okay. Uh, anybody here like me and love a little bit of confrontation every now and then? Yeah, there's usually a couple of us, right? I don't shy away from confrontation. It doesn't bother me. I, if you don't like me, that's not the end of the world, okay? I'm not saying that you need to be the person that challenges somebody, but you need to be the person that recognizes that somebody doesn't belong there or that they're new, okay? Here's a simple way to challenge somebody. Hi, I'm Dave. Are you new here? Oh, where do you work? Who are you working for? Well, that's fantastic. What projects are you working on? That's a very simple way to challenge somebody. Have I been mean? No. Have I been confrontational? No. No. All I've done is ask them questions. I'm trying to build trust with them or, or, or establish trust with them. And if they can't give me the right answers, I now no longer trust them. I don't have to be the person that kicks them out, but I have to be the person that goes back and calls somebody who will kick them out. Plain and simple. Okay? Uh, implement technology. Okay? You notice that technology things are all the way down here at the end. You want to screen emails. You want to screen you know, web content, all of that, trying to filter out all of the phishing and, and uh, uh, other stuff that goes on, the malware, that sort of stuff. The other thing that you need to do is implement some sort of SIM or some sort of user behavior tracking, something that when a user fails, okay, when, when their human interaction fails, you can detect it. Okay? You want to be able to detect anomalous logins. Somebody's logging in from a VPN from a foreign country that's never ever done that before or should never do that, okay? You want to detect logins at two o'clock in the morning. You want to detect, I mean, these are simple things. If you just start looking for these things, you'll be able to detect where some may, maybe somebody gave somebody a username and password or maybe somebody's kid got access to their phone or something like that, right? Crazy stuff happens. You need to look for that stuff. You need to detect it. Here's, however, where you need to spend the most of your time dealing with social engineering. Employee training. These are attacks directly against your user base. These are attacks that most people don't even know exist. That they would have no idea how to defend against them. It is completely unfair for us to expect that our users are going to be able to identify a social engineering attack and know what to do with it, even if they did, if we don't train them, okay? You have to begin to train them. You have to be able to say, here's what this looks like. Guess what? 
The traditional CBTs, computer-based training, the little one-hour video you watch every year and sign off and say, yeah, I'm done, it doesn't work. It's proven time and time again. Look at how many studies there are that people go through social engineering training and then within 90 days fail it miserably. Okay? These old methods don't work. You've got to make it real to them. You have to engage them. Okay? You have to get them to feel like, hey, this is something that's important to me, not just because it's important to my company, but it's important to me. Okay? Once they feel that internal compelling reason, it'll be easy and they'll start thinking about it all the time. But you got to find out what that is, and you got to deal with that, and you got to you got to pull them in. Okay, uh, gamification, using games to enhance learning. Instead of just having somebody sit around and listen to a, a, a video, break them up into some teams. Have them come up with their own phishing email. Have them come up with their own. How would you break into our building? Okay, if you were going to try and sneak in, how would you sneak in? Wow, that you'll get some really cool stuff. People have some fun with that, and they'll begin thinking. Okay, that's what you want. You want their brain cells to be going like this, okay, not like this, right? You want them to begin to work in teams. You want them to think about it. Encourage that, okay? Uh, the other thing that we do, we fail at miserably, is we teach for one learning style. We used to teach college years ago. Um, and one of the things that, that is very important is we have to understand that there are different methods or, or ways that people learn. Some people are completely auditory. So you can stand up here and talk, and all, I wouldn't even have to have slides. You'd be able to get everything I said and, and internalize it, and it would make complete sense. Other people, you haven't really listened to much of anything I've said. You've been reading the slides, and that's where you're getting most of your information. Other people are tactile learners. They've got to do it. Okay? You've got to plan your training around every single type of learning that you have. And if the larger organization you are, the more types of learning you're going to have. So you've got to plan around that. Okay? The other thing is, awareness is not training, and training is not awareness, okay? That even if you do do a, a one hour, or 30 minute, or a 15 minute training session, that's not awareness, that's once a year. Somebody got trained to deal with something. Awareness is, how do I keep that top of mind? How do I keep them thinking about it, okay? They're two very different things. We need to stop calling it awareness training and call it awareness and training, because that's exactly what it needs to be. The last thing that you need to do is validate your program, okay? Once you've done the training, you need to go out and see what worked, what stuck, and what didn't, okay? You need to do facility entries. You need to have people doing phishing testing. You need to have uh, you know, all of the different components tested to see where are we doing well, where are we not, how can we improve our learning, how can we improve our training, uh, what do we need to do to, to make that better, okay? So, um, Real quick here, in summary, okay? social engineering is here to stay. Uh, I know I, I do this quite a bit, and a lot of times I, I get a few people that are like, eh, Dave, I don't really believe you. I, I, that's fine. I, I can tell you, all I can do is tell you, go read the research. Okay? Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, Symantec, uh, Ponemon, uh, 451, Gartner, I mean, you, you name it. There's, there's all sorts of research out there that says social engineering is on the rise. Uh, it's a component in more and more attacks. It's getting more sophisticated. Uh, it's getting more targeted. This stuff is not going away. So you better start figuring out how to prepare your user base to deal with it. Okay? Uh, I guarantee your organization is going to suffer a data breach from social engineering. Okay? Most of you are thinking, ah, Dave, that's, that's getting a little out there. You're making a pretty bold statement. Okay? I guarantee you, somebody in your organization is going to say, hey, I don't have access to this. And they're going to go to a friend, and they're going to say, hey, do you have access to that report? Can you give me that report? Yep. There you go. That was social engineering. I manipulated a friend of mine to give me access to data that I do not have access to myself. That's social engineering, folks. So you probably have been a, a, a target of this way more than you're even really thinking about, and these things are only going to continue. Okay? And we have to get people to think about that. Uh, the study of, uh, of psychology, sociology, human behavior, uh, it's continuing to evolve. Okay? Uh, the bad guys use it as much as the good guys do, okay? and they're actually really, really good at it. They're actually probably better than the rest of us because most of us, we can't even comprehend the ways that we would manipulate people, right? The depths that we would manipulate people, okay? 
the depths to which we would go to manipulate people. The bad guys, they got no morals, they got no conscience, they don't care. So they'll take it way further than we could ever imagine. Okay? You need to count on that and you need to bet on that. Uh, and then the last one, again, I can't stress enough, employee training. You have to train them. You have to get them to where they understand the attacks that are coming directly against them. Okay? These things are not coming against your servers. I mean, they still are, but they're going to be coming against the people. We need them to understand that. Okay? All right. Any questions? you hit under 100, uh, depending on wh what type of company it is, uh, it's usually much, much more difficult. Um, and, and just because everybody knows each other, you know, you stick out like a sore thumb, there's, there's no way that, that you're going to uh, get in. And that's typically, though, when we switch from going in as an employee to going in as a repairman, uh, you know, uh, fire marshal, you know, for site, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so the studies right now uh, are somewhere between 5 and I think 12 or 13 percent, it just kind of depends. Uh, they're a lot more common in like a manufacturing firm or a government organization um, because they're wanting to get intellectual property um, or they're trying to get access to classified data that's maybe just really super hard to get a hold of from a technical perspective, but you can walk in, find it sitting on desks all the time. So. Those are kind of two big areas where I think you have more um, susceptibility to physical attack than others. Obviously, that's a pain, so we may not be able to get into their data center, but we'll get in someplace else. Um, and really, all I have to be able to do is get in, and then I can start hacking from the inside and doing other stuff. So. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.